want to talk about Scala for Java programmers and uh, have a little agenda with us with important concepts. Uh, Scala unifies object orientation and functional programming. So we, we look in, into some of these concepts like the, yeah, every value is an object. We look into mixed and base composition with traits. Wait, Enno, uh, is this really the best way to to talk about Scala, you think? Uh, I mean, we want to learn Scala here, not define Scala, right? Uh, yeah, you're right there. Yeah, okay, so we skip this one. Uh, what we really want you to learn. The, the journey from Java to Scala is very easy. Scala gives us a lot of new possibilities, which we won't show you here. But they are there, believe us. And you don't really have to understand all these concepts we have on the first slide. They are there. You'll hit them sooner or later. But you don't have to understand them to start with Scala. Yeah, so let's start with the warm-up then. Uh, just to get it running. We basically, we divided this presentation into two parts, where the first part is uh, really easy, where we just show how to get started to make things compile and work in Scala. The second part, it gets a little bit more tricky. We introduce a few new concepts and it will be, the pace will be higher. But don't worry about that because after the first part, you can, you already know how to program Scala. The rest is more like nice to have, see what the possibilities are. Some of the possibilities. Okay, so most of us, we are Java programmers here, right? So we have legacy Java code. Uh, so we invented some legacy Java code here, which is basically main method. Uh, we were thinking in lines of batch here. We have something that uh, runs jobs for us. So we have some JDBC job factory. We can uh, think that it probably gets jobs from the database. We pass it to job control and then stuff happens. What exactly happens is not that important. The important thing is to remember what this code looks like now. And we will get back to it by the end of the presentation. Uh, the first thing, you, the first problem you will have uh, when you want to convert from Java to Scala is to, um, like, how do you, uh, how do you create your project layout? How do you um, organize your your Scala and Java code? So here is something that we found work. First, you refactor your Java code. You take one module that the one part of the code that you want to change to Scala. Start with one, one module only, and then. You refactor that one so that it stands alone already in Java and then put a Scala module in between. Once we've done that, then we can move code from the Java module to the Scala module and uh, rename it Scala. And voila, we have now a Scala compilation unit, maybe is the word for it, that uh, it doesn't compile because it's Java, right? But, uh, but this is our first step in our conversion. So, this list here, to the right to make it compile, you don't have to memorize it. What we did was we basically fixed one thing after another and noted down what we did. So we're going to do the same thing here. Go after, go take one step at a time and see what happens and what the end result looks like. The first thing is that public is a default keyword in, uh, in Scala. So uh, that means that, uh, or actually public, there is no public in Scala. If you don't specify public, then it will be public. So we remove the public. Uh, variables in Scala, uh, we have a keyword to, uh, to declare them. It's var. So we have to add that there. And uh, types in Scala are after the identifier. And uh, I don't know if you want to say something about that. The, the important thing is normally the name you want to define. If you have a variable, the name of the variable is the important stuff. If we have, as in Java, the, the type before, you normally don't find the, na the, the name of the variable. And as we've see, seen later on, the, the types aren't, you don't really have to write the types in the code. Yeah, pause that for a uh, Look at this, how the, how the types are scattered or, um, over the code. You have like types a little bit of everywhere. And now, let's do the change in Scala. I noticed that on the flight here, actually, how it aligns neatly the types are on the right side and every, and the names are on the left side. So I think that's kind of nice. Um, 
Then generics, they choose another sign for that. It's uh, square brackets. So let's just change that. What? <laughs> we're done there. Yeah, we're done with that. Uh, and uh, we declare our functions with, uh, with def. They're called functions in Scala, not methods. Uh, so then that's done. And uh, def, it stands for define something. So then uh, the definition should come uh, after the name, I guess. So uh, it, then we put an equal sign in between there because we sort of define this name to mean whatever is after the equal sign. So we insert that. And then comes the, a little bit of an odd thing in Scala for Java, for a Java program, and that the, the void keyword here. And in Scala, we, the equivalence of this, this the rough equivalence is a unit. So you can use it interchangeably. And in fact, Java methods will be converted to unit uh, when you call them from Scala. Uh, but unit is a value. It just doesn't have anything on it. So uh, that, uh, it's not that important. You can think of it as a void, but it is actually a value, and there's a single instance of it. So we did that. The last thing we need to do is we need to initialize our variables. Uh, Scala requires that. So we do that. Yeah, and uh, now we have actually something that compiles. So we're done. We're Scala programmers. Simple, right? Hmm? But of course, of course, if if Scala was only about this, then it wouldn't be much of a, that big a deal. So we can also remove some redundancy here. And the redundancy is uh, yeah, some, some Scala tricks. The the last statement in a block is the the value returned. So so we don't have to write return. We just remove it everywhere, and and the last thing is is the one we return. The the types are inferred. So the Scala, Scala compiler looks into the, what we write and, and understands the type that is returned from, from the other types that are around. So we can uh, just on these places uh, remove the types. If we don't write this uh, equal sign for, for the methods, uh, the Scala com compiler understands, okay, that there's nothing to return from that method. So, so unit is understood implicitly as well. And if we have blocks with just one statement in it, we don't really have a block. It's like if sentences. It's, in Java, it's often good practice to write the, write the parentheses there as well, but you can do without. So we can remove it here as well. And then there's this useful thing, uh, use less thing of a semicolon on the end of the right line. We can just skip it. It's allowed to write it there, but yeah, we can get around without. So now we have, we have a bit more Scala thing. And the, the same code can be expressed even shorter in, in Scala. And the important thing here is it is still a, an equivalent to the Java, uh, Java code we had at the beginning. We need used some uh, annotations here that uh, tell the Scala compiler that we want to have the Java view of these fields. So we get get methods and set methods for all the fields we have declined, de declared in the class. So these two things are exactly the same from the client point of view. Yeah, so if you're using some uh, web framework, uh, for instance, uh, name one that uses um, getters and setters extensively, then it's quite easy to write these data structures here. Now, a Java program, I guess you all see that this is not an immutable, immutable structure. You have like getters and setters, and that's bad practice, right? We always write final on our, that's right? Yeah, Scala allows uh, Yeah, we, we, we want to. Scala allows us to write small code. That's uh, what we want to say. And it's more compact. It's still Java. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is we want to make it immutable, don't we? And and uh, Scala dif dis uh, distinguishes variables and values. So we have the var keyword, which says tells us this is a variable, but we can just uh, uh, change it to values. But the first thing we want to do is to add a constructor to this class. Uh, so the only thing we have to do there is to change a little bit. And now you see that the fields from the class became parameters to the constructor. The constructor is defined on the class. 
and uh, now we get back to to the variable value thing. I will just to mention one thing here that, uh, like, can you, can you see what uh, what we don't have to write here? In a Java class, if you would have a constructor here, you would have a, like a constructor, right? That uh, you would have to declare the fields in the class that they are there, and you would have to also assign them in the constructor. But in Scala, we say that since they are uh, since they are in a, when they are in the constructor, they are also accessible as fields in the class, which is pretty often exactly what you want, right? So. So now we get back to to what I mentioned before. The variable keyword is changed to the value keyword with val. And now they are read only, so it's final fields for in so Java world. Yeah. And Scala actually removes all the setters by that change there also. Now we want to use uh, default arguments, uh, basically default values for, for these arguments in the, in the constructor. And uh, that basically means if we don't name the field when we call the constructor, it will get fall back to this default value. So what we introduce here is are the default values that are assigned if we don't use it. So we have an, a little example here where we just use the same constructor which normally use, requires all these three fields, but we just use the name field. So the compiler understands, okay, we just set the name field so the other ones will be the default values. And the thing is that you can, if you want to, you can specify uh, fields by position like in, in Java, like we would do. And this is actually quite new in Scala, like uh, by name references. But what I think is interesting with by name here is that I think it totally eliminates the the goodness of uh, of setters, doesn't it? One thing that is really good with setters is that you can actually read what you are setting, and you can leave some things out if you don't want to set them. You can have sensible defaults in your constructors. But now you can actually, in Scala, you can express all that but still have an immutable object with the constructor. You can have a list of short question here. Has anybody written a class with uh, about 10 constructors in Java? When you have lots of fields in the class, you get more and more combinations of the, the constructor fields, and it just call this. And this is definitely eliminated because we can get around with just one constructor. No one wrote uh, 10 here, 5? Uh, OK. Yeah. So it happens because of these combinations. Uh, so, and now we have an immutable class, so immutable bean, setters only. This step here, uh, you may not want to do it right away. Uh, we showed it here because it's easy, but you may have a lot of Java code that actually depends on all of these setters and the mutability of the object. So, depending on what your Java code looked like before this, uh, you may want to wait with making it immutable, but uh, this is how you do it. Okay. So why Scala? Why, I mean, did this really give us anything? Would anybody think so? The question that is more important to us is why not Java? Because Java, I mean, I've been coding Java a few, a few years back in time, and it has, a, it has had this journey, and the language has evolved. We had inner classes somewhere in 97, then we had some new keywords here and there. We had uh, the generics leap. That's really where, where the language evolved quite a lot, a huge change. But at the same time, we, we, if we look at uh, what generics gave us, Oops. Um, there are rough corners. It is very, very hard to introduce new concepts to an existing program language without making, uh, without breaking backwards compatibility. And this is shown with the generics. There, there has been much critic, criticism around the generics. And uh, it is because it is very hard to get good concepts into an in existing language. How many in here are programming in Java? Yeah. How many are using generics? Oh, good. And so that's like half. And, and now we, we, we looked uh, into Java 7. Many of you, you will have been following what's happening there, the new language changes. And, and uh, everybody expected huge changes, but in the end we come with a little product coin, which gives us a few new operators in the language, because it is so hard to introduce these new concepts into the Java language without destroying 
old stuff. I think we had a question there. No? Okay. So Good. we ask us, is Java dead? Have we seen all, everything we, with Java? And uh, no, it's not. Of course not. I mean, COBOL is still around. Maybe Java is the new COBOL. That's what uh, we are going. We're going to solve the new year 2000 and something problem that will arise. Or I don't 2010? know. 2010. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but Java is Java dead? No, nobody would say that. Java is more than the Java language. Java is the whole Java platform. We have the Java virtual machine, which will be there, which will be there much longer than anybody of us. So the JVM is still the future, and what we are looking for is a, some new ways to use the JVM efficiently. So why Scala again, then? I think one thing that was really appealing to me after I saw Enno's first presentation uh, at my company about Scala, I, was one thing that really appealed to me was that it's bytecode compatible with Java. What you get out of the Scala compiler is actually Java, so it interacts with your existing Java programs and you can write Scala programs that Java programs can use. Uh, and I think that's an important feature why, because I think Scala is probably something that's more, most considerable if you already have a lot of Java code. If you're starting from scratch, then you probably have a bigger choice. But I think byte compatibility is really an important part of, of Scala. It's designed for extendability. And that's, that's back to, to what we ha saw with, with Java. Java is kind of stuck in, the, in how the language looks today. We, it's so hard to evolve it. Scala takes another way there where it uh, is not always obvious when you look at Scala code. If you're talking about the language Scala or the API you're using just in this bit of code. And that makes it extendable. You can introduce new things that appear as keywords or structures in the language but basically are solved through API. And that makes it much easier to, to take stuff away and to add other stuff later on as we see that, okay, that was the wrong way. We just use another API and get better at it. Yeah, uh, and also what we will see a little bit in our further on in presentation also, we will like, scratch on the per surface of a higher level of uh, abstraction and functional programming is a, is a big component in, in that. So, so I think that um, one thing that's so appealing that I'm still discovering new things every day that I look with when I, when I work with Scala is like, wow, that's a neat thing. I didn't think of it. You could do it like that. And then I can express the same thing here. I can say what I mean, not what, what exactly how to do it. Um, I, I can program in a more declarative way, which I think is a huge benefit of, uh, of uh, modern languages, which is what actually takes Scala a step further than, than, than Java, where that Java is quite verbose to say pretty much anything. So, the thing is that I, as much as I hate to have a quote by Henry Ford here, and so many bad ideas uh, came into software development from, uh, from Taylorism and so, but uh, one thing that you did get right, I think, is this quote, uh, many other as well, is uh, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they'd have said a faster horse. And I felt a bit like that. You know, I didn't quite appreciate all the new things in Scala that I had never used before. And it took a while of, u of using them and failing with them and succeeding with them uh, to actually appreciate that they're there to the point where I sit every day and like, can't. I would. I wish I had a fold left now. That would be neat. And th this, what we want to say here is, you don't know that you want it. <laughs> Trust us. <laughs> We're not selling this, by the way. <laughs> okay. So that was the first part of the presentation. Now, uh, how many here are familiar with the functional programming? Have, have uh, tried it a bit. Yeah, still quite a few. So lot, lots of people will be able to follow. Others will maybe hopefully see what we're trying to do with it, but maybe not get the details. It's not important. You can already program in Scala. The first part is what you need sort of to get started. So if, you, if, if we lose you here, not a problem. It, it, we just want to show possibilities. Get ready. Yeah. 
Okay, back to our product layout. We take something more real and put it in Scala, some class that actually does something, not just the data structure. Bean, so. And we, here we have the Java code for it, and uh, we just uh, quick and easy make it to compile and, and, and make it be Scala code. You remember all the steps, so it ends up something like this, right? <laughs> The, the the new thing here that you haven't seen before is uh, this uh, for loop syntax. And this one doesn't compile now because uh, here the, the job get steps will return a Java type which is, doesn't have a for each method which is required for this for loop. And uh, th this is called structural typing and we won't get deeper than this. But uh, we can ha get help here. Um, you know, yeah, we can import Java conversions, which will uh, help us to automatically convert this Java type to, to an appropriate Scala type if we need it. We can think of it, about it as auto-boxing, as we have it in Java between basic, ty uh, uh, basic types and, and uh, object types. And this is actually one of the ways in which Scala is extendable, that you can actually define your own auto-boxing that makes sense in your domain. Maybe it makes sense for you to convert strings to some uh, domain-specific object that the generic language designer could never have thought about, but it makes so sense in your domain. Then you can actually make those rules and import them into your, into your program. That's, that's just one of the ways where Scala is extensible. And now we want to highlight a little bit of code here. Do you like this? We don't either. No. Scala hates null. We want, to, we want to remove Null from the language, but we can't because it's, it's there. It's deep down there in Java. It has to be there. So we have to deal with it in Scala. Scala allows Null. Uh, and that's actually one of the most hates. painful things about It hates Null. It allows it. It allows, OK. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> so Scala loves options instead. That's um, one way to deal with, with Null. That, Without that, Null. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so to accomplish what you want to accomplish with null without uh, some of the side effects, that's one of the ways. And options is something we want to talk about here because that's something you will run into pretty fast when you start uh, learning Scala. So we go to our job factory and we magically introduce a new thing here. Anybody heard about traits? Trait is kind of an interface in Scala. Uh, the difference to Java interfaces is that we can add code here as well. Uh, but we want to introduce a new method. Create is the method that uh, was required by the Java code. What we want to introduce is a uh, method apply, which then returns this option construct which we talked about just before. And th there's something special with this apply name, but we'll see it later on. We can, as we have a trait here, implement this method we require. So we add some implementation to the apply, apply method, which will use the create method and put the null, null check in here, and then return an option. So yeah, there's still null around, but because we create was something Java defined, uh, Java method defined, but we now package, depending on if we get null or not, package it into an option. An option as a return type indicates to the Scala programmer, okay, here I get something, or I get nothing. So I, it gets indicated in the API, that you have to deal with the case that you don't get an object. Yeah. So remember these. None means nothing, empty. Some means something. And it's like zero or one. There's not zero to manage. Zero or one. Uh, and also, rem one important thing about Scala, it comes it's, with its functional inheritance here. It's like everything returns. What? Everything here returns a value. So this if statement, it actually, it is, it is on the last line. And you remember, we don't need return because the last statement is, uh, is returned the result of that. And here the last statement is an, is an if statement here, if else. So the return would either be this or this. And that takes some getting used to, but it's actually quite, quite neat. Uh, and yeah, an interesting thing there also, like uh, in Java, there's no way really to, you know, just return something from an if statement to the calling method. You, you would have to define a new method 
to, to be able to do that, or the return statement will exit the whole method. So, so that's a subtle difference uh, that sometimes you can get away with less of extracting small, small, small methods. But this uh, interface drop effector, we want to use it from Java. So, so we have to, to combine this trait drop factory with a bit of Java plumbing code. Yeah, because these traits, that's, uh, we didn't say this out loud, but uh, this is, um, this code here, you can see it as compiler copy paste. When we use this trait, the compiler will tuck this code here into the class where we use the trait from. And it's called mixins, and some people maybe tried Ruby or something and uh, are familiar with the concept. So, so for the Java, we had some plumbing, and that's not more than this. We, we create an abstract class which uh, extends objects, basically nothing, with this job factory stuff. Which yeah, we have to do this because Java doesn't have this automated cut and paste <laughs> compiler thing. So we have to sort of give Java some abstract class, the class that contains this code. Okay. So. We can also do something about this if, if else. A more Scala way to do this, uh, it would be to do something that's called pattern matching. And this is not, this is not the same as a switch case in, in Java. And there is a lot to pattern matching. We could probably talk a day about just that. Uh, but uh, you can see this is essentially the same as this if else. And if we would remove this uh, space in between that we kept not to move things around too much, then uh, then it would be more compact way of writing it. What, what uh, Scala helps us with is to make sure that we take care of all the cases we, we, we could need here, which if sentences, if clauses doesn't really help us with that. Yeah, let's say that we had like more than two values, then Scala would nicely indicate a warning there that you are not taking care of all the cases here. Good. So. Now, now we want to make uh, use of uh, the uh, job factory apply method in our Scala code. So, so here we, we still use the Java version, JF create. And we now want to change to the improved stuff, which is uh, the apply method. The apply method returns an option. And the option has either a value or it doesn't. So we want to get the value, or if it doesn't have a value, we want to use this empty job constant. This way we make sure the job always contains something meaningful in this context. And that's, uh, it takes a while to know, like, okay, what's the big deal? I mean, uh, like, if else, like, if not, like, what's the difference? And the thing is here that the option, it guarantees that there's no way you can get a job from the option unless you say what you want to do if there is no job. Null, you have to know that it can sometimes be null and you have to deal with it. So it's much more explicit this way. Uh, and you're not allowed to get the value unless you provide an alternative if there is no value. Everybody with us? And in this case, we just uh, put in a, a constant value, this empty job constant here. But that, uh, uh, okay, it, yeah. it's not yet. <laughs> not yet. We told you about the apply method here. The special thing about this is that uh, if we don't specify apply, just call it like on the, on the object, then uh, Scala interprets that, that, is, that we are calling apply, actually. So it's some kind of default method and applies the name for of the default method. And we, you can have def different parameter lists for that, so, so you can have many apply methods. But the, kind of a shortcut. Yeah, it's still our same old factory here. Uh, we can also, we can put code in here. Here we put a side effect. If there is no, no value, we'll print hello on the console, and then we will throw an exception instead. Uh, so. And then we, now we're entering the domain of functions. This is actually what this, this thing up here is, is actually an anonymous function that we, that we declare here in, in place, or a closure if you, if you wish. And um, so let's talk a bit more about functions. When I started, uh, you know, learning more about functions uh, to refresh my memory, it helped me to think of them as something that uh, take something and turns it into something else. So my metaphor for that is, uh, is a transformer. You take altering current on the left side and you get direct current on the right side of some value. 
So Scala basically has a notation for that. It looks like that. It basically means this is a function that takes, uh, an, in, takes an instance of AC and turns it into an instance of DC. Is that clear? Yeah? And uh, now we have a value here, transform it. It is of the type function. And this is the thing here. It's like functions are values like anything else. And, and uh, types to the left of the colon, to the right of the colon, and the value to the, to the left. We can, of course, have uh, other functions. So if you think of our factory that we had there, basically we take a, a string and then we turn it to a job if it exists, an optional job. So our factory that we had in the, in the slide before here, that's actually, we could see it as a function that turns strings into job options, right? And for, for this uh, type, we, c we could have a more Java-like uh, notation, which is with generics. And this exists in parallel in Scala as well. These two things mean exactly the same thing. Whereas the first one is more like, it, it, it comes more natural after a while. Whereas the other one is, is, is more the, how we could write the same thing in, in, in Java as well, if, if we really, really wanted to. And the second notation here, it makes it really clear that functions are just objects, right? So if functions are just objects, then we should be able to extend them, shouldn't we? So, so here you can think of this type of function as an interface with two generic types, one for the input parameters and one for the things that come out. Back to the code. Yeah. We can uh, move into our factory, so. Let's go to our factory here and uh, let's make our factory into a function. Uh, and as we said, we hinted that we should be able to extend them, so let's do that. So what we say here is the trade job factory is extending this interface or whatever we call it function with this parameter list that we saw before. So the whole class is stated to implement a function which could be written in this other notation as well. Here we use the job factory as a type uh, in here. Oh, you have a mark there. But that doesn't really do much more than th this method that takes a string and returns an option of job, which we want to put there here. So this job factory fulfills the type string to option of job. So the thing is here, like from, from having a specific factory here now, we can take anything that turns a string into a job option. Uh, we can pass that in. So now we don't have to extend that factor there if we don't really want to, but we may still do so. So we, we're, this is more abstract dependency here. We have decoupled ourselves a little bit from our concrete factory here. And that allows us to write factories really easy because, you know, functions in Scala, they are so easy to define. You just define a method there. This empty job factory definition up there takes parameter name that of type string, returns some new job, passes name in there, and empty list, empty Java map. So if we had written a type on this method, you know, remember, we don't have to write the types, but we could write the type as well. And that's exactly the same type we used on the slide before, string to option of job. So we can I mean, just pass it down there to our job control as our new job factory, which is defined with very little boilerplate there, just uh, the essentials. And in the more Java way, we had to have this uh, extend the class of job factory, implement the method there, and, and then send, send this class in. We get rid of it. We're back in our, um, our main here. To, um... So if we look at it now, after all the stuff we, you've seen before, we have still the main method in Java, but many parts of it are defined in Scala. 
see it did, didn't change did it it's, uh, it's exactly the same now from the outside so from from java perspective we still have the same java classes and everything but behind the scenes we can actually use functional programming in scala without even noticing from the outside and this is um, how how neatly scala and java blends if you do it if you if you do it correctly it's not that straightforward. I struggled a lot with. I, I did. A, I made a lot of different mistakes that were not as straightforward as, as this to be able to mix and match. But uh, but after a while, when you, once you get the hang of it, you can actually really move very effortlessly between functional and object-oriented programming in, in Scala, which uh, does open up a whole new dimension of possibilities that that uh, I didn't even know that I wanted before. <laughs> Okay, sum it up here. You don't have to do everything, Scala, right away. You can stop right before our um, Millennium Falcon there uh, picture. You can stop right before there and just, you know, code Scala like you would in, in like you would code Java, and that's okay. Uh, you would get a little bit nicer syntax and type inference and have to type a little bit less. You wouldn't get all the all the benefits, but maybe it would be enough to to make it interesting. And after a while, you, you'll want to tap into all the new things that Scala gives you. But you can do so at, at your own pace. And I, I, saw, I saw a lot, I've been reading a lot of forums on the internet, and that's actually, it's, Scala got a little criticism for, for that. Like, uh, you know, here you have this really advanced thing with lots of things that you don't really, really get. It's really hard. And then you just say, ah, you don't have to use it all. You can use the same old Java stuff. Then what, what's the point? But the thing is that, when you start using it for a while, it looks like it's a lot in Scala, but but it's actually in some ways simpler than, than Java because it's very consistent. There's a very small set of uh, of rules that you become more and more familiar with and start to expect from from things. So uh, so it looks like really huge and uh, mind-boggling Scala, but it actually is quite well thought through. It's very neatly implemented. So it's very easy to get going uh, as a Java programmer to use Scala. But once you're there, you're trapped. You, won't want to be, you don't want to move back to, to Java. You really miss the things when you go back to Java and, and all the stuff that, that's in there. And what I notice with, for myself also, when I code in, in Java now, uh, I find that I, I use some patterns that I picked up from Scala that are actually possible to do in Java in some way. Some things are a bit more cumbersome, so you won't be that functional in Java. You can do it. You can use anonymous classes and so on, but that will be so much boilerplate around it so you don't see what's happening. It's not making things clearer. But some of the of the, of the the patterns there that, that, that you learn in Scala, you can bring them back. And there are actually some places where you can, for instance, with anonymous classes, um, exploit the same things in Java. Not maybe as nice, but nice enough it will add some value. In the end of the day, all the Scala code is compiled to the JVM. And the JVM doesn't do much more than Java allows us to do. So it, it's everything you can do in Scala is possible to do in Java as well. But you will have years of writing Java code, which whether you miss the meaning of why you did it, just because to get it right. Yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. Like, if it's uh, if it's as easy to write a function in Scala as like put two curl braces there and some code in the in between that, then then you would probably use it. Then if you have to do like new some class, I have to make up a command curly brace method, and uh, you know, once you remove that boilerplate, it becomes actually accessible. It's still there, but it's accessible that way. That's uh, all we want to say for today. So, now you can ask questions about performance and things that you're wondering about. Yeah? No? <laughs> yeah, what, what about, about performance? performance? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, in the end, it's, it's, it's actually just Java bytecode that, that gets executed. The thing is that uh, what, hi what is hidden behind the, the Scala text is not always obvious as it is in, in Java. In Java, it very much sees what you get, while Scala is, is what you see is what you mean. So there may be more 
anonymous classes and so on that are created that in some instances may have performance impact. But in general, your sometimes scala is faster, sometimes it's slower. Uh, but on average, I think it's very comparable. One thing Scala gives you much more than Java is the, the one, the, the thing with the immutability, because that will make the, the garbage collection much more effective, as the, the um, garbage collector ca can uh, see, okay, this object will never change, so, so it can work with it in another way. And mm -hmm. even more interesting is the immutability that is more natural in, in Scala when we talk about concurrent programming. Has anybody done uh, concurrent programming right? I think the thing, the thing is with the, uh, it's not like you can't write immutable code in, in, in Java, it's just much harder because you don't have all the other tools to work with it effectively, I think. So that's, uh, that's I guess, the message. To be able to do that, you, you need more tools. More questions? Uh, you mean more suited for Scala than in Java and... Uh, I think uh, if you like the of this some of the libraries, then you find it hard to do There may be some, uh, I mean, some, some libraries are, you know, Java libraries, they, they, they are uh, very much mutable code. It's not like you can't use it from Scala. Uh, like, for instance, Spring, you have a lot of setters on everything. And you, you may still use that. I mean, Scala does not uh, put any any obstacles in the way for, for doing that. So what is re really, really popular at the moment, uh, I see that uh, lots and lots and lots of wrappers are around popular libraries. So you can have, you know, a really neat Scala layer on top of some some uh, popular Java library, like OSGI or some Spring, uh, Spring stuff. Or Swing as well. Yeah. It, because in Swing, you have all the event listeners and that stuff. That be just becomes closures in, in, in Scala. So it's, it becomes a much nicer interface with the possibilities Scala gives us. Yeah, that's a, that's a good example where Scala actually adds value to, to, to something, something we already have here. Okay, the question is about how it compares to other languages on, on the JVM. Yeah. And uh, there, there are many other interesting languages around on, on the JVM, that, that's, that's for sure. What Scala does more is, is like the, the statically typed, there is a type system behind Scala, which most, the dynamic languages, that's why they are dynamic, they don't have it. Yeah. And this gives another level of security while we are coding. Because the compiler will tr track down some problems we have, which we won't necessarily see before we run the program in, in, in dynamic languages. I think uh, there also there, there's a there's a backside to that. I mean, the thing is that yeah, Scala is more similar to Java in that sense. It, it is statically typed, so I think uh, in that way it's more easy to introduce Scala to Java programmers because you know you used to have some people like cling to the type systems and some don't. Uh, there are things that are possible to do in dynamic languages that you can't do in, in Scala because it's static. And uh, like there are some, some kinds of dynamic metaprogramming and so on that is not possible. You can come pretty close in Scala with the, with the structural typing and those kind of things, but you're not really, really there, the same as in, in Ruby or, or, or Python or, or, or other dynamic languages. But uh, it is a statically typed language, so similar to Java in that way. The question about IDE support, and no, it's not good. It's coming, and it's uh, it, it, it's much easier for Scala to provide good IDE support than for dynamic languages because there is a type behind it. You know what methods yeah. can be called on this ob object. So that there are plugins to Eclipse and, and NetBeans and uh, IntelliJ. Uh, it's not good yet. No, I struggle a lot with with Eclipse, and actually the. The nightly build of uh, of, uh, of um, Scala 2.8 for Eclipse uh, is more stable than the than the than the earlier version because they changed the arch architecture completely around Eclipse 3.5, but it's not available for Scala 2.7. Scala 2.8 should be done about now, 
but ID support is pretty crappy by, by Java standards compared to what you're used to. Uh, I've been using Eclipse, and you know, you, you, after using it for a while, when you're patient, you find your ways around problems and so on, so you can sort of work with it, but it requires some patience and, uh, and figuring things out. I talked to Jonas Bonier here in, uh, before, and he, he said that he's quite happy, I guess, uh, all is relative uh, with the, the IDEA plugin, so that's apparently shaping up now also so it, it's getting better and better i mean for the for the time i've been using scala like the last year or so, year or so then I, I i have already seen improvements but they're still compared to what you used in java it's not even close but there's there you know you need much less functionality in the ide plugin because w what the ides give us today is creating getters and setters and all this kind of writing code for us it's not that important in Scala because we often don't have to write that code. Yeah, the compiler does, takes over a lot of the job of the IDE actually, so that's uh, that's the the good thing. But uh, still, you want your code completion to be able to explore the libraries via, and that it, it's working-ish sort of. It's it's okay, but it, sometimes it crashes. My advice to everyone trying Eclipse, like, make sure that you set up the the amount of memory Eclipse has. Okay, three more minutes. If there's not any more questions, I think that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.